Manu Shafiq knows the worlds of economics and finance well. She was the youngest ever vice president at the World Bank before coming deputy managing director at the IMF. At the Bank of England, she was responsible for a balance sheet of nearly 500 billion pounds. Forbes even named her one of the most powerful women on the globe. Now she's back to the world of academia as director of the world-renowned London School of Economics. In September, I spoke with Manu Shafiq for Leaders with LACLA. There's huge transformations in technology, society, and everything else. What, what do you see, how would you describe the current environment that we live in? Well, I think all over the world we're seeing people question globalization and the impact of technology. And you can understand why. If you look at what's happened to income distribution around the world, the people who've done the best in the last decade are the top 1% and the growing middle class and emerging markets. But the middle class in the advanced economies have suffered flat or declining real incomes. And so there is a backlash at the moment and we see that with the rise of populism across a whole range of countries. And, uh, and I think that has colored both economic and Poli economics and politics all over the world. So it, it, has inequality really led to populism? And if so, how do you create a fairer society? Yeah. I think it's, it's, uh, it's not just about inequality. It's about people's feeling about their own futures and the futures of their children and whether they see opportunity for themselves and their children in the future. So a lot of people maybe have experienced flat incomes. Uh, but, uh, but they very much worry about whether they have the skills to succeed in the, in the economy of the future. Uh, and a lot of that is driven primarily by technology. People often blame globalization. I think it's actually the root cause is technology. Globalization just makes it all happen faster because the technology spread more quickly. Um, and you know, we've been here before. Whenever there's a big technological disruption in the world, People worry about what's often called technological unemployment. Um, but we also know from history that new jobs emerge. And the real challenge for our societies is, do we prepare people sufficiently quickly for those new jobs, or do we leave some people behind? So does a fairer society start through education? Well, you know, I hate to say this, but all roads lead back to education. Uh, both education from the very beginning, uh, because we know that the highest returns are at early childhood uh, and the benefits of, of very young children getting taught how to learn and have good cognitive development at the early stages has payoffs throughout their lives. Uh, and in many ways, if you want to equalize opportunities, those early stages are the most important. But we also need to think much more than in the past about education later in life. And the old model that you get all the education you need to thrive in the economy between the ages of 18 and 21, which is the old higher education model, is completely outdated, uh, particularly in, in a labor market where people are going to have many more jobs than they did in the past. Who, whose job is it to re-educate? Right, in that early parts, but also later parts, is it companies or is it the government? Yeah. I like to think of it as a partnership between individuals, governments, and business. And there's always uh, the question of how do you pay for that? Uh, and I think countries have very, very different models. If you look at the US model, it tends to pour put more of the responsibility on the individual through student loans and, 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 and a more kind of market-oriented approach. In continental Europe, you tend to have more state-funded systems with incentives for employers to provide training. I think I'm agnostic about the exact structure, but the problem is it needs to happen. And I think what we're seeing at the moment and why levels of anxiety uh, are so high is because there just isn't enough resources going into it. I mean, you have the the Nordics, the Danes, the Finns, the Swedes putting 1% of GDP into what are called active labor market policies to prepare workers for the jobs of the future. Most advanced economies are put less than half of that. And so whether it's funded by employers, by the state, or by individuals through loan programs, the key problem is we aren't investing enough. So what happens if we don't retrain the workforce? Well. I think we're already seeing the consequences of that, which is if people don't feel they can participate and benefit from the economy of the future, 
they will vote for policies that thwart modernization of the economy. They will vote for protectionism. They will vote for policies that take us backwards. And much of the politics of today, the sort of nostalgia politics we see, is a reflection of individuals feeling like, I haven't got a chance in that future, and so I'm going to do everything I can to thwart it. But how much does this have to do with media, right, with social media, and how much it, is it real that actually, you know, there are stagnant wages and people don't feel like their kids will have a better life than they have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the media obviously has a very important role to play in, in clarifying the debate, and shows like this are a really important part of that. Um, I think, though, that the evidence in terms of the decline in social mobility in many countries is pretty clear. Uh, if you look, for example, of how long it takes to go from being in the lower income group to being middle class in different countries, it varies hugely. Uh, you know, in again, the Nordics always stand out as the more successful ones. It takes 50 to 60 years to, be to become middle class. In countries like the UK, the US, it can take 100 years. In very unequal societies like South Africa, Brazil, uh, it can take over 300 years to go from one class to another. And so in those societies, you're really telling people you haven't got a chance. Uh, and I think giving people a sense that they do have a chance will be transformative, both to, for our economies, but also for the politics of those countries. You, you've always done research on you know, the social impact of things. What did you see when so many did not see? Like, why did you start working on those things? Maybe, you know, before your time almost. Well, I think for me, I, I, I was very keen to understand the root causes. Uh, and, you know, one could see the backlash and I know what the easy answers were, but you know, the motto at the, LA, at the London School of Economics is to know the causes of things. Because only when you really understand the root causes will you, will you be able to find the right solutions. And, so, uh, so much of what I see now is a reflection of the fact that we had an old social contract which said what you would, ex what you would get as a citizen uh, and what you were entitled to and what so how society would support you in difficult times. I think that social contract is broken now. Uh, and it's broken because of technology, also because of the changing role of women mm -hmm. uh, in the past. Uh, a lot of the social contract was borne by women. They looked after the young and the old for free. Women are now working, and that's and, and our social contract hasn't kept up with that. That's why we have an old age care crisis. That's why we have problems with understanding, you know, with, with childcare and those kind of issues. And then I guess the third dimension of the failing social contract has to do with what's happened to the environment, and that's a a whole other range of issues. And so we need, to, we need to redefine those relationships. But how do you redefine that social contract? Well, I think there are, there are many aspects to it. And uh, again, it requires a partnership between business, government, and individuals. Uh, and there are many models out there. There are many models for how to organize childcare, for example. It's pretty clear that countries that spend more on family benefits mm -hmm. are more successful at getting women to stay in the workplace. More women working in the workplace means there are more, there's higher output in the economy. It also means that you have higher productivity. There's some really good research that's recently done at the IMF that shows that the more women working, the more productive the economy is as a whole because you do a much better job of matching people to the best jobs. And if you have more men and women working, they have complementary skills. And so productivity in the whole economy goes up. So that is, solving that one problem is an avenue to solving many, many problems. Uh, and I think it's possible to structure it in a way, if you look at it holistically, uh, that means that a new social contract could be both socially better, but also economically better. Up next, how will technology reshape the jobs market and how can universities train their students for careers that don't exist yet? More with Manu Shafiq next.
London School of Economics has produced many notable alumni in the worlds of economics and business, including more than 50 heads of state or government and 18 Nobel Prize winners. But as the world changes with ever faster advances in technology, how should the LSE prepare its students for their future careers? Manu Shafiq is still with me. If you look at the pace of change in technology over the last 10 years, does that accelerate? You know, is it quadruple fold? Will it accelerate in the next two years? And can education really keep up? Or are we training for jobs that won't exist by the time people are trained? Yeah. I think it's uh, impossible to predict. We all think that change is happening faster than at any time in history, but I suspect previous generations said the same thing when electrification came. Um, so that's impossible to predict, but I think that you're absolutely right that trying to be able to predict which job people will be doing in 10 or 20 years time is a mugs game. Uh, in the 1960s, there was a huge field of something called manpower planning where people tried to predict what job needs there were and it was complete failure. What I think we, can, we know though is that, and we're starting to think about this at, at the LSE, is what skills do we equip the next generation for? And we know they'll need digital skills. And so we want to make sure that everybody has a, a core competency in being able to operate in a digital economy. We know that entrepreneurial skills will be more important in the future. Um, and we know that having a broad ability to learn and get up to speed quickly, no matter what job you're doing, will be essential. And having that kind of flexibility in the way you learn will be a vital skill. And I think if we do that for the next generation, they will be ready for whatever jobs may appear in the decades ahead. So what is that critical thinking and how is that different from what we've done so far? Yeah, I think critical thinking is absolutely vital. Um, you know, a lot of us went to school, including me, when we were uh, asked to learn lots of stuff and regurgitate it back in an exam in an almost mechanistic way. That is a complete waste of time in an era of search engines. This generation can get any fact they want at their fingertips within seconds. Uh, what's really tough, and we all experience this every day, is we have this deluge of facts and sifting through it and coming to a view on it and having an independent perspective on it, that's what's difficult and that's what we have to teach the next generation. So if you had to go back and go to university tomorrow, what would mm -hmm. you choose? That's a good question. I would. Um, I think I would certainly invest a bit more in kind of digital competence, but I think I would still go back and do a broad kind of, for me, I'm interested in the social sciences, so I would do a broad social science degree because I'm interested in understanding the world uh, with a bit more quantitative methods, I think, added to it. Do, do you, um, if you look at what you're doing now at the London School of Economics and what you did at the Bank of England, how is it different? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I. Um, I sometimes joke that you know the biggest challenge in central banks is groupthink, uh, a tendency for everyone to think the same and the consensus view to prevail and not having enough criticism and, and, uh, and debate. The biggest problem in a university is lack of groupthink <laughs> because everyone's an individual, everyone's got their own point of view, everyone likes a good argument, uh, and getting consensus about the collective view and the collective interest is much harder in a university context than in a central bank. But, but what does it mean for central banks going forward? I mean, as you know, we're in 2019, we're possibly running out of ammunition, we have a possible recession looming. Yes. Do we need to think completely differently to what we've done in the last 10 years? Well, I think, I think uh, central banks have been quite creative in the post-crisis period with quantitative easing and all sorts of other measures they've taken to stimulate the economy. I think they will continue to need to be very creative going forward. I don't quite buy the argument that they've run out of ammunition. I think there is more that central banks can do, but I do accept the point that at the margin, the impact of repeating the same things diminishes over time and you need to come up with some new ideas. Um, and. I also think we're entering a period in which fiscal policy will have to play a bigger role. Is that how you read the appointment of Madame Lagarde as head of ECB, that she's a mix of like a politician and, and the first female to lead the ECB? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Christine will do a great job at the ECB. I think she will, uh, she will be able to do three important things. One, she'll be able to 
marshal all the talent of the staff at the ECB to come up with new ideas. Second, I think she's got the political negotiation skills to manage the European political scene and the role of the ECB. And third, she's got great communication skills, which are necessary for any central banker to persuade the public that what they're doing is the right thing. Up next, challenges in central banking. What can monetary policy do to reduce inequality? More with Manu Shafiq next. When Manu Shafiq was at the IMF, she was responsible for many of the crisis countries in the Eurozone and Arab countries in transition. Later, she moved to the world of central banking at the Bank of England. So what did she learn about how policy can reduce inequality and what do today's central banks need to do to prevent the next crisis? Manu Shafiq is still with me. What does the BOE need? Right. But would you have been at the BOE had you known about Brexit or is it becoming much more politically difficult to be an independent central bank? Well, I think, um, I think it is a much tougher time to be a central banker, uh, partly because central banks' roles have grown and, say, in the case of the Bank of England, taking on things like supervision and financial stability, which were the right decisions, but it means you're more visible. Central banks' balance sheets have grown, all of them have grown enormously, and that means you're taking on more financial risks and you're much more active in the markets. Uh, so I do think it's a tough time to be a central banker. But I think those, those three things that I mentioned, an ability to pull together the talent of mm -hmm. staff in the central banks, the ability to manage the politics and the ability to communicate are, are vital for all central bankers, especially these days. Manu Shafiq, if you look at central banks around the world, who actually has the toughest job? <laughs> <laughs> I think they all have a tough job these days. I tell you, I, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I think they all have a tough job. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, cause, because the ones in emerging markets are at the receiving end of a great deal of global volatility and there's not a lot they can do about it and they have to kind of manage those risks. I think the ones in the advanced economies are dealing with a zero lower bound and all the challenges of that. So I, I think it, I, I wouldn't single no out. One has it easy. Yeah, no one has it easy is what I'd say. <laughs> uh, we were talking about fiscal policy, right? And it's very clear that you think fiscal policy will ha is a solution. Why are we not getting fiscal policy from, from countries? Well, I think, I think there is an emer uh, the signs of a shift that many people realize that fiscal policy will have to play a bigger role. It's not a panacea. I think monetary policy is still an important role to play. But uh, there are things that fiscal policy can do uh, both to help stimulate demand, but also to help uh, transform the supply side of the economy. So I, I think in more and more countries, we are seeing that, uh, that, that, that argument being made. We were talking about you know, fairness, a fairer society, retraining the workforce. If you look at the global economy, do, do you worry that if there were something really ugly happening, the next recession, that countries would not come together to take the action that they did in 2008, 2009? Yeah. You know, I, I, um, I sometimes joke that the, well, first to say, the, the actions that the G20 took in 2008 were decisive and impressive, both on mon coordinated monetary policy and fiscal policy. I sometimes joke that the G20 is sort of like a tea bag. It only works when it's in hot water. Um, and the rest of the time, you have lots of communiques which don't do very much. I would like to think that if we had another crisis, and we did, we were in hot water together, I think the G20 would have to come together and act decisively. Um, I think it was exceptionally well done at the time of the crisis because we had very good leadership uh, across many countries. Uh, but, uh, but crises do focus the mind. When do you think the next crisis will be? <laughs> we'll or what, you know, where it'll I be know. next to no. <laughs> Cassandra <laughs> with her crystal ball. <laughs> you know, I, I, economists are notoriously bad at predicting turning points, so I'm not going to even go there. But, um, but you know, there are lots of warning signs out there that there is a slowing of the world economy, and we've, you know, we can see that trend, and it's good to prepare. Do you ever miss being an economist? <laughs> 
Well, you know, I've got lots of good economists at the LSE, and we, so I'm still, a, still in the thick of it. And we've got lots of policymakers coming through uh, for discussions and lectures and, and for advice. And so, uh, so I still, uh, I still feel uh, quite engaged. Um, Manu Shafiq, what defines you as a leader? So you've always been in public policy, yes. right? Has, has that, have you always thought that actually you, what was it? You want to give back to society or is it something else? Yeah, I mean, I think for me personally, that sort of public purpose was always very central to my thinking about my career. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was born in Egypt. I saw a lot of poverty growing up uh, uh, around me. I, you know, my family lost a great deal at one point and, you know, went from being rather well off to not being very well off at all. And so I could see that 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 economic outcomes affected people hugely and that there was a way that policy could improve that. And so I guess that was what motivated me from the very beginning. Um, and I think the challenges of leading in 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 the public realm are are quite tough because you uh, the metrics are not so straightforward. You don't have a simple bottom line that you've got to deliver against. Um, and you've got many, many stakeholders to manage. And there's mistrust. People, you know, what can the institutions, I'm thinking of the World Bank and the IMF, do may, maybe better to reconnect with the common citizen? Yes, it's a huge challenge, especially in the cacophony that we all live in, where there's so many messages and being heard is really difficult. Um, and that's changed hugely, I think, doing public policy you know, I could still remember when I first started uh, at the World Bank, you know, every World Bank report was classified as official secret and it was never disseminated. And when, you know, you were a poor PhD student and you could get your hands on some of that data in one of those reports, it was like a gold mine. I mean, now, of course, everything is published instantaneously. It's all available on the Internet. Uh, and that's a huge, that's great. That is a wonderful piece of progress uh, that we've moved away from that kind of secretive, closed world to one that's much more open. Um, is it ever too transparent? I mean, is it, is it ever, do you ever think that actually there's so much information out there, mm. even for economists, that you kind of lose your train of thought? I, I guess... No, I, I actually think on balance that transparency is good. Um, you know, it comes with some cost in terms of um, in terms of uh, in terms of how debate is conducted. But I think net net, I think it's a good thing. Um, what do you like most about being at the London School of Economics? Is it the students? Is it the teachers? I think being completely surrounded by lots of clever people is really fun and challenging. Um, I think I think we play a really important social purpose, both in terms of educating the next generation, but also in providing a place where civilized, rigorous debate can happen. And um, there isn't a lot of that around these days. <laughs> and being able to preserve a space where people with very different points of view can come together and have a civilized argument and disagree but use facts and evidence as the basis of that disagreement is so important. And I think if we can preserve that at a place like the LSC, it's hugely valuable. Manu Shafiq, thank you so much. Pleasure, pleasure. Really lovely to be here.